So I, I should probably say thanks so much to to Ian and to Max and to everybody in the the, the Wilson uh, Center has been great hanging out and talking to people and it's such a pleasure to see my dear old friend Bonnie who I went to graduate school with many we won't tell you how long ago um, but it's a real honor to be here and I love talking about uh, Canadian history and talking about slavery so I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea about what I'm talking about with like biographical sketches and then I'll tell you a little bit about sort of the thin line between slavery and freedom among the black loyalists and loyalist slaves in the Maritimes right after the Revolutionary War. Then I'm going to give you a couple sketches of uh, enslaved black people, okay, and then end it with just a basic question about what all of this stuff means. And I'm happy to, to answer any questions that y'all have, okay? Great. So um, <laughs> slavery is the most neglected aspect of pre-Confederation Canadian history. Like, I really actually believe that. Um, yet traces and examples of slavery are imprinted in various documents throughout the Maritimes, Upper Canada, and Quebec. It is not surprising that slavery played a part in Canadian history, but it is a little startling that it has not received widespread attention from the general Canadian public and historians alike. Why is that? Is it like a question? You got to wonder, because in the British Empire, there's slavery everywhere. Right? Like my friend Chris Brown, he wrote a book called Moral Capital. You know, he said the idea of a British empire without slavery was something that resided in the realm of fantasy before 1772. Right? So, I mean, anywhere that the British have, uh, you know, part of the empire, it's part of the British Atlantic world, you're going to find some forms of slavery or what my friend Jared Hardesty would call uh, unfreedom. Just five years ago, my dear friend and colleague Ken Donovan noted that although various artists, writers, directors, and historians have worked on slavery in Canada, it is still not a significant part of the Canadian historical narrative. Right? Um, Studying slavery in Canada as opposed to, say, you know, escaped American slaves, as he put it, goes against the dominant image of Canada as a land of freedom. The focus, understandably, when discussing African-Canadian history has been on the Underground Railroad, the Black Loyalist, and other groups who found freedom under the British flag. Yet, the reality is, thousands of black people were enslaved in what we'll call colonial Canada, just for simplicity's sake, right, um, between the 17th and early 19th centuries. We must recognize the significance of slavery to the history of Canada even, and this is important, if there were no large-scale slave plantations or major staple products like cotton or tobacco. One way to recognize slavery is to examine biographical sketches of enslaved people in the Maritimes and other parts of Canada. The enslaved population of Canada was multiracial and multicultural. It included men and women, Africans, African Americans, and importantly, indigenous people. Um, these people's lives deserve to be told as historians develop an understanding of what slavery actually meant in pre-Confederation Canada. You know, and as we think about trying to tease out the individual lives of these people, it's important because I know like in the States, and it's like mad different there right now than it is in Canada. Um, <laughs> I know, right? I can't. I just can't even do it. But um, we won't go there tonight. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, a lot of my students, you know, when I talk about slavery, especially in the United States, they just see this like big black mass of oppression. Like it, to them, it's like they, they, it's hard for them to differentiate between slaves, right? They can't, it's very hard for them to understand, you know, it's like they kind of get it, but they don't get it on a deeper level. The slaves were different people with different ideas, different names, different attitudes, diff good traits, bad traits. You know, part, I think, of the project of g getting back these individual lives is to humanize slaves, right? Like, we don't have to dehumanize them like their owners did. We can look at them in all their individual complexity as much as the documents will allow. And of course, you know, the historian Carlo Ginsberg once noted that if the sources offer us the possibility of reconstructing not only indistinct masses, but also individual personalities, it would be absurd to ignore it. In the case of black slavery in the Maritimes, this lofty goal runs up against the reality of inadequate documentation. 
How can we tell stories of individual slaves using limited source material in an archive that rarely allows slaves to speak for themselves, unless mediated through the pen of a white person, right? Traces of enslaved people in the Maritimes can be found in runaway advertisements, slave for sale notices, the Book of Negroes, problematic as that might be, okay, court records, wills, government documents, church records, petitions, letters, and other sources. These sources are far from perfect, and they present challenges for historians to use them in ways that highlight the experience of enslaved people. Again, the documents written about slaves were usually recorded by people, and we have to remember this, who generally speaking held incredibly demeaning views of people of African descent. Still, I would argue if we read these sources carefully, we start to hear the stories of individual enslaved people. They struggle during their lives to have a meaningful existence in a society that dehumanized them. In documenting the stories or the lives of uh, individual black slaves, enslaved black people, historians can help restore their place as important players within pre-Confederation Canadian historiography. Telling the stories of enslaved black people in the Maritimes illuminates various facets of the wider system of slavery and how it connected to other parts of the Atlantic world. Thanks to the work of many historians, we sort of have a roadmap of how to explore the lives of enslaved black people in the Atlantic world. In 1996, uh, one of my mentors, uh, Paul Lovejoy, wrote that, and he was, he's always ahead of the curve, right, <laughs> in many ways. But Paul Lovejoy wrote that in studying slavery and the slave trade, biography can capture details of history by reinserting individuals into the reality of slavery. Biographies, he said, put flesh on the bones of the past. And I can't really say I'm doing biography, as my friend Don Wright always reminds me. It's more like biographical sketches, more like biographical fragments. Um, so what I try to do in this paper is attempt to put flesh onto the bones of enslaved black people in the Maritimes. These people came from an extraordinary range of backgrounds, traditions, and experiences. A few of them were from Africa, while others spent various amounts of time in Atlantic slave societies, including the West Indies, South Carolina, or Virginia. Still more were bought up in small numbers from societies with slaves like Boston or New York. By reinserting the individual into slavery studies in Canada, we have an opportunity to tell stories that expand upon our knowledge of Canadian slavery. Biographical sketches of enslaved black people, however brief, are significant because they speak to different strands of maritime slavery. Biographical sketches shine historical light on maritime slave experiences in the United States prior to arrival in the region. They shine a light on slave migration to the Maritimes from various points in the African diaspora. These biographical sketches shine light on slave labor, slave community, slave-slaveholder encounters and relationships, uh, and those whites who also sought to challenge slavery. So in illuminating the lives of these individual enslaved people, um, historians can tell the story of slavery outside of the staple producing regions of the British and French empires, right? Just because you were a slave in Jamaica doesn't mean that somehow your life as a slave was any more meaningful than a slave who lived in, you know, Cape Breton, right? It's still slavery, right? Um, black people experience slavery in widely divergent ways in various parts of the French and British empires. But the Maritimes, we also must remember, remained intimately connected to the West Indies and the southern states through trade, family connections, and the movement of slaves between these very different regions. So what am I trying to do here? I mean, basically, this paper is sort of taken out. It's something I'm writing uh, for the CHR. And it's basically taken from the research for my forthcoming book, which is a biographical dictionary of, of enslaved black people in the Maritimes. And there's 1,350 names in it, which is like kind of a lot. And we keep finding these people. Is, 
it's like ridiculous. Like I'm, I'm like every time I turn around, we we find more. So I know the minute this book comes out, somebody's going to send me an email that has like seven more names. And it randomly, right? Like I'll look through sources and I find more and more names of people. But sometimes I just have people randomly who will say, "Well, you know, I heard you're writing this. You know, I read one of your books and I heard you're writing this biographical dictionary." Um, so, by the way, I was looking up some family genealogy, and I found a, this probate record in Digby, Nova Scotia, and it lists three slaves. Here's, here's a photocopy of it. You know, so it's it's really interesting how uh, that's working out. Um, whatever the points of origin of these slaves, their lives cannot be fully captured in an academic artic article or monograph, right? And I would know, right? Um, these types of publications are important, but sometimes to make an overall point about slavery in the Maritimes, we have to focus on broader trends that can only tell so many individual stories. So what I was trying to do in in in, in this biographical dictionary. And and also in this article is to sort of tell these stories of these individual people. Um, and that's that's sort of what I, I've tried to do and sort of what I've, I've, I've sort of uh, been hoping to do. Now, one thing that I think is really important for me to mention is before I go get a little further into the biographies, am I keeping everybody awake? Is everybody doing OK? Yeah, am I, is it making sense? Kind of, a little bit. Okay, just making sure. I like always check, you know, right? But um, <laughs> you're a little more lively than my students, right? Okay. Um, no offense, UVM. Thank you, President Garamella. <laughs> in case he watches this. <laughs> okay, you can have fun when you're a full professor, right? Um, so, <laughs> and, and then. One thing that I think is so important to understand about the Maritimes post-revolutionary, and I bet it's the same in Montreal, and I bet it's the same in, 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 in Upper Canada as well, is that when black people get to the Maritimes in large numbers with the loyalist influx, it's very important to remember that these labels that we have for these people, free black, black loyalist, black servant, black slave, could change very quickly, right? We sometimes talk about black loyalist and loyalist slave as if those labels and those statuses and categories are static, but they're not. And I think that's really important. You know, it could change very quickly because black loyalists were, some of them were often re-enslaved, right? That literally lost their freedom, like just literally like, you know, they, they were basically put on a farm of a white loyalist who said, yeah, I'm going to pay you and just never pays them. They've literally been re-enslaved. At the same time, some black people who end up in the Maritimes in 1783 as the loyalist slaves, they run away from their owners. These labels are changing all the time. And I think this is probably the most significant issue to understand about post-revolutionary slavery uh, in the Maritimes, and I would probably say in Upper and Lower Canada, because the loyalists went there as well, right? Um, a black person could arrive in New Brunswick as a slave only to escape from her owner before being recaptured and sold to the West Indies. Or a black woman might uh, run away from slavery and end up joining the other free black loyalists and going to Sierra Leone. It's, it's, very, it's very complicated. So freedom and slavery, they're existing together. It's a moving target, right? And so it's, it's sort of an important thing to think about. My, my mentor, as some of you all know, is Jim Walker. Uh, he wrote the book, the, the sort of standard book on the black loyalist. You know, and he wanted to emphasize black freedom and black agency. And I don't think by saying what I'm saying right now that I'm taking away from that. I'm simply saying that there's a, very, there's a lot of complexity that's going on on the ground. Um, and to go a little bit further with this before I get into the biographies, I really felt like I, I, felt like I had to say this today. Um, is that you know the the threat of sale to the West Indies for these black people who moved to the Maritimes, it, you know, in, between 1783 and say 1792, it's ever present. There is a fear, and if you look at the court records, the court records are replete in Shelburne with black people sort of being kidnapped and sent to the West Indies, right? Now, sometimes the local authorities caught these white people who were trying to do this, and the black people were, were freed and everything was okay. But this is a business, right, where if it's successful, there's no court record of it, right? Like, they're not trying to brag about it. They know it's illegal. And... <clears throat> 
So it's very important. The threat of sale to the West Indies was a form of racist terrorism. That's what it was, without question. That slave owners and kidnappers deployed often enough that the Nova Scotia Assembly took note of it. In 1789, in an unpassed bill, the legislators noted that, quote, attempts had been made to carry some of them, they meant black people, out of the province by force and stratagem for the scandalous purpose of making property of them in the West Indies, contrary to their will and consent. Another example of the willingness of white loyalists to attempt to re-enslave and send free black people to the West Indies is the case of Myrtilla Dixon. During the Revolutionary War, she had migrated to Charleston and eventually went into, as she put it, into Colonel Fanning's service, who also owned several slaves. But at this point, by coming to British lines, she should have been free. Dixon also worked for several well-known loyalist families who all owned slaves, the Winslow family, the Barclays. And Mrs. Barclay, uh, who she was working for, was a sister of a very famous New York loyalist named James Delancey. The Delancey family in New York is a very powerful, wealthy, well-off family. They all own slaves. And so she's working for uh, Mr. and Mrs. Barclay. They employed her in Nova Scotia, but Dixon ran away from this employment um, because according to the court record, she said, Mrs. Barclay, threatened to ship her to the West Indies and there to dispose of her as a slave. And being fully persuaded that she was about to be put on board a vessel, then ready for sea, she has since taken refuge with her father, Charles Dixon, in Birchtown and praise your honor's protection until Major Barclay can prove his claim. So what I'm getting at is that the line between black servants and black slaves was extremely fluid and could easily be transgressed and manipulated. The racism that black people enslaved or free faced could be extreme. Indeed, Baptist preacher, African-American guy, David George, one of the founders of the Baptist Church, not only down in the, in the South, but also in Nova Scotia, summed up racial discrimination that free blacks encountered. He, he said, this is a little quote from his narrative, he said, uh, white people in Nova Scotia treated many of us as bad as though we had been slaves. What he meant by that was that free blacks in Nova Scotia were treated like they were slaves. And he would know, right? Um, even those blacks who were free or indentured servants were often treated as slaves and, consist and consistently faced the fear of being sold to the West Indies or elsewhere. And I think it's not too much of a leap to suggest that, you know, many white loyalists probably did not really distinguish between an indentured black servant or just a free black servant and a black slave. I'm not really convinced that they saw those two categories as all that different. Um, for example, in 1792, Thomas Clarkson, famous British abolitionist, he's the brother of John Clarkson, if you didn't know. John Clarkson was a Royal Navy officer. He was a lieutenant. He was about 27 years old in 1792. He helped along with black loyalists like Thomas Peters and some other people to arrange the uh, move to uh, Sierra Leone. So Thomas Clarkson wrote... Uh, in a, in a magazine, he, he basically said, um, whites reduce again to slavery those Negroes who had so honorably obtained their freedom during the war. They hired them as servants and at the end of the stipulated time refused payment of their wages, insisting that they were slaves. In some instances, they destroyed their tickets of freedom. We call those, uh, if you, we call those GBCs. And that means general birch certificates. It's just like a, it's like a ticket. It's like a, 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 a like freedom papers. That's all. Um, and those enslaved, and then enslaved the Negroes for not having them. <laughs> In several instances, the unfortunate Africans were taken on board vessels, carried to the West Indies, and they're sold for the benefit of their plunderers. So this context of re-enslavement and deeply held racist attitudes should be uh, kept in mind when we talk about these biographies. How are we doing time-wise? Great. OK. Um, Similar to New England, with the exception of the Narragansett region of Rhode Island and part of southern Connecticut, in 
you know, in the Maritimes, there were no planters, no large plantations, plantation overseers, slave gangs, black drivers, absentee owners, right? And like New England, neither region really produced any staple crops, at least a staple crop that slaves worked on, right? And everybody understands the only reason why slavery exists in the New World is because it produced staple crops, right? The first one is sugar that causes the slave trade. For those of you who aren't familiar, cotton, tobacco, so on and so forth. Not in that order, by the way. Uh, rice, so on and so forth. So it's much easier to focus on slavery in a place like Jamaica or Barbados or places where there's these very large enslaved black populations rather than a place like why study, you know, the, the, not, the, the much smaller population of enslaved black people in, you know, Worcester, Massachusetts or where I'm from in Burlington, Vermont, right? There were slaves there too, unbelievably, right? Um, yet both New England and the Maritimes use slave labor. Uh, and sort of relied on it in certain ways. And we don't want to ignore that, right? And so I hope that just giving you a little bit of that background helps. So I'm going to give you a few biographical sketches, and then I'm happy to take a lot of questions. You can ask me anything you want about, about slavery in the Maritimes. Um, I bought a couple of my books in case anybody asked me a question. I need to like get a document out. Um, so I'm going to tell you about Lydia Jackson. I'm going to tell you about a man named Hector. and. Um, and then I'll tell you about a few people who are unnamed. And uh, then we'll conclude and have plenty of time for questions. <clears throat> First person I want to tell you about is uh, Lydia Jackson. And you know, this is, one of, uh, this is one of the few people that we actually have a fair amount of information on. But even the people we have a fair amount of information on, we really don't have that much information on at all. But in her case, we actually do know some things. Um, because I think it's, it reveals the importance of using biographical sketches to sort of study enslaved uh, black people in the Maritimes. A closer look at her life says much about the violence that female slaves experienced and how they could and did resist their owners. Her story sort of reveals how one black woman attempted to escape from violent re-enslavement and obtain freedom in the context of post-revolutionary Nova Scotia. The Book of Negroes, uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a, it's a large book that was recorded by British officials to write down what black people they were taking out um, of New York in 1783. Um, it's a very, very, very important source for African American history and African North American history. It's one of the most important th sources that we have, but it's not a perfect it's not a perfect source, and I can go into that during the question period. Um, in the Book of Negroes, there's not an entry for Lydia Jackson, but there is one for Lydia Johnson. It seems plausible that the woman recorded as Lydia Johnson is the same person that John Clarkson referred to as Lydia Jackson, but maybe not. If so, Lydia Jackson resided in a place uh, called Nine Partners, New York, before or during the Revolutionary War. Um, her owner was a patriot, so she ran away from him, or as she put it, uh, left him, and escaped to British lines where she secured a GBC, which supposedly guaranteed her freedom. Like other black people who evacuated from New York, she was placed in the possession of a white person, in this case, a man by the name of Lieutenant uh, Surgeon. Now, just to be clear, everybody, when you look at the Book of Negroes, it'll have like, you know, it, it says, I'm, I'm saying literally what it says, it'll say Negro's name, you know, age, and then like a little description, it'll say something like uh, a stout stout man or a sickly uh, person or something like that. But uh, almost all the black loyalists that you find in the Book of Negroes, even if they're supposed to be free, they're listed as being in possession of a white person. And this is part of the reason why I think re-enslavement can happen. Um, so we don't know if these two are the same people, um, but basically, after arriving in the Maritimes, Lydia Jackson and other free black loyalists settled at, in a place called Manchester. Okay, this is far away from other black loyalist settlements. It was in Guysborough County, okay, or Guysborough Township, and we can only imagine what that would have been like in 1784. Um, Jackson soon found herself in great distress, as she told Clarkson, because her husband deserted her. 
Now, we don't know the identity of this man, this, her husband, or the cause of his leaving, but the economic hardship encountering free blacks resulted in some men looking for any type of work that they could find, and sometimes this resulted in the separation uh, from their families. Um, the difficulties facing free blacks were recorded by a uh, Boston King, um, although he was specifically speaking about Birchtown, these conditions prevailed in the rest of the Maritimes as a result of an economic downturn uh, after the Revolutionary War. So uh, Boston King described the conditions in appalling terms. He said, uh, many of the poor people were compelled to sell their best gowns for five pounds of flour in order to support life. When they had parted with all their clothes, even to their blankets, several of them fell down dead in the streets through hunger. Some killed and ate their dogs and cats, and poverty and distress prevailed on every side, so that to my great grief, I was obliged to leave Birchtown because I could get uh, no employment. And people should remember that Boston King was like a master carpenter. So you can only imagine what it was like for totally unskilled laborers. Um, without her husband, Jackson was in rather desperate circumstances. And a man by the name of Henry Headley uh, invited her to live with his family, as he put it, uh, to live as a companion for his wife. In less than one week, Headley told Jackson that she had to either pay him rent or bind herself indenture herself, that means, to him for seven years. We can only imagine the terror, right, that Jackson must have felt at this ultimatum. But it is a testament to her courage and toughness that she refused this form of re-enslavement. They argued over the issue, and Jackson eventually agreed to be indentured for only one year. But, as John Clarkson said later on, taking advantage of her ignorance... Clarkson, in calling her ignorant, he didn't mean that she was ignorant to say that she was dumb. He meant that she was illiterate. Um, the term, instead of one year, was forged for 39 years. So she signed an indenture with her mark that basically made her a slave for, uh, for life, right? Um, Headley then transferred the indenture to a man by the name of Dr. Bullman of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. Um, from Germany, he had served as a surgeon with the British Army during the war and eventually settled in Nova Scotia. Now, Bullman immediately informed Jackson, and I'm quoting now from Clarkson's conversation with her, to her great astonishment that she had been articled for the term of 39 years and that she had been made over to Bullman for the consideration of 20 pounds, which he had paid to Henry Headley. Now, nobody's going to pay 20 pounds for somebody that they think is just an indentured servant, right? He's paying because he's going to treat her like a slave for life, obviously. Um, the power differentials in this situation are obvious to the reader. The re-enslaved Jackson had been purposely misled and two respectable white inhabitants had taken her freedom. She had very limited choices. Like, really, what was she going to do? Right? Um, she tried to make the best of the situation, but her life descended into a hellish reality of consistent beatings and other abuses. John Clarkson bluntly noted that Dr. Bullman, quote, turned out to be a very bad master. And I'll add, indeed. He continually beat Lydia Jackson with, and I'm quoting now, tongs, sticks, pieces of rope about the head and face. Apparently, Bullman's wife also participated in these beatings. And this is something that a lot of, a very recent book by Stephanie uh, uh, Jones Rogers called They Were Her Property Studies White Female Slave Owners. And her point is that, you know, white female slave owners were just as involved in slavery as their white male slave owning uh, counterparts. And, and depressingly, what's really strange about this, if you don't mind me saying, is that, you know, some of the stories of brutality, bizarrely enough, that we know of between a slave owner, okay, and a, um, and a slave are sometimes between uh, white female slave owners and black female slaves. And some of the oral tradition seems to pin some of the brutality on white female slave owners. I haven't been able to figure out exactly why this seems to be the case, because we know that men clearly owned 
the majority of slaves. It's a very strange thing. I'm not sure why the oral tradition says that. It's a little unclear um, to me. Um, to go a little further, so in one instance, Lydia Jackson talked to her master in a modest and respectful way to the point where Clarkson noted that she had spoken with, quote, the least intention of giving offense. But Bullman took occasion to knock her down and though she was then in the last month of pregnancy, in the most inhumane manner, stamped upon her while she lay on the ground. Now, sadly, it does not seem that the baby survived because when Clarkson met Jackson, he did not mention her having any child. So I don't know if that meant that, that this beating uh, you know, ended up ending her pregnancy or is very unclear, but the way Clarkson writes it, it seems to intimate that basically because of this beating that Bullman and his wife were giving her that she lost her baby. Um, sadly, where do we, you know, where, where do we, where do we go from there? At this point, Jackson, and here's an incredible part of the story. I hope everybody hears this agency of this this black woman who has every bit of odds against her, right? Um, this is incredible. Um, she attempted to stop the abuses of Bullman. You're wondering how? This enslaved and virtually friendless woman had the, the, the intelligence, the common sense, to go to a local attorney named Mr. Lambert or uh, he was probably German, so we think the name actually might have been Lombard. But taking a chance to gain her freedom by contacting an attorney after receiving so many beaten, beatings speaks to Lydia Jackson's courage, but also her acumen in understanding that an attorney might be able to free her from the clutches of Bullman and his wife. Lambert seems to have taken Jackson's case to court, to his credit. But Clarkson reported that, and it's, he's vague about it, because of the, quote, overbearing manners and influence of Bullman, the case was, he said, soon silenced. So it's very unclear uh, what that actually means. Maybe he tried to bring it and he wasn't able to. But at this point, Bullman threatened to sell her to some planter in the West Indies to work as a slave. Of course, that's why I went into that whole thing about you know, to show you this is happening often. Um, but then changed his mind and sent her to work on his farm about three miles outside of Lunenburg. Bullman instructed his other servants, that's the word that Clarkson used, uh, to beat and punish uh, her as they saw fit. After working as an enslaved laborer for three years, she somehow escaped from Lunenburg and made her way to Halifax, which would have been a journey of 96 kilometers on land. She might have taken a boat, which would have been probably a lot more expedient. Um, Clark, we don't know how she did this. All Clarkson says about it is that her escape was quote unquote wonderful uh, and that she experienced numerous hardships, but he doesn't go into detail. Probably because there were people willing to help slaves escape and he didn't want to say who they were or what houses she was staying at or who was feeding her or whatever the case may have been. Uh, once in Halifax, Lydia Jackson asserted her rights, and this is very important, as a British subject, petitioning Governor Parr, who well, not surprisingly, ignored her pleas. She also approached Chief Justice Thomas Strange, who later on would become an anti-slavery judge. But in this case, he only promised her to look into the matter. Finally, she approached John Clarkson, and he took up her case. He sent a letter to Bullman and consulted a lawyer who thought Jackson might be entitled to a unpaid wages, but also told Clarkson it would be exceedingly difficult to gain redress in the courts. So he advised, um, so Clarkson advised Jackson to quote unquote leave Bullman to his own reflections, which is to say to, to hope, hopefully God will make him feel bad about what he did. Um, in the end, Jackson escaped slavery again and went to Sierra Leone with 1,200 other black loyalists. And here's the most depressing part about this story, is Clarkson added in his diary, quote, I do not know what induced me to even mention the above case, as I have many others of a similar nature. For example, Scott's case, Mr. Lee, Smith's child, Motley Rhodes' child, Mr. Farish's Negro servant, and so on. Clarkson's final remark about Lydia Jackson are extremely haunting for historians because there must be several cases of re-enslavement that were not recorded, that we just simply uh, don't know about. 
So just want to give you just much shorter examples, and then we'll, we can get into just a few, uh, lot, or lots of questions. Um, like Lydia Jackson, other maritime slaves uh, were Atlantic world and continental travelers who moved through different societies along with other immigrants, trade goods, ideas, and forms of enslavement and freedom. One ex excellent example of these multiple backgrounds is a slave named Hector. He was born in the West Indies, possibly in Africa, but probably in the West Indies. He eventually became the enslaved property of New York loyalist Frederick William Hecht, who also owned several other slaves. Now, during the American Revolution, Hecht served in the British Army, and he served all over uh, the South. And he ended up taking Hector with him to, of all places, St. John, New Brunswick in 1784. And Hector decided, once he got there, that the best thing he could do, of course, would be to run away. So he does. And so Frederick William Hecht puts a slave ad in, and he says, this is for my runaway Negro man slave named Hector. And the amazing thing about this advertisement is that it tells us several things about Hector that we will never know about the majority of enslaved black people in the Maritimes, right? Because Hector mentions all sorts of things, like where Hector was from, his occupation, and some personality traits. Here's what he said. He said, Hector is by trade a cooper. That's a barrel maker, so we know he's skilled. He's a skilled slave. Uh, he's a tall, slender fellow. He speaks English like the West Indian Negroes and is very talkative. He came from St. Augustine, that's in East Florida at the time, to this place via New York. On December last, he had his feet frostbitten on the passage, and he has a very lazy gait. Now, that might not seem very interesting, but there's a lot of information in there for people who do slavery, you know, in Canada, because he, they're telling us a lot. His trade, that he might be from Africa or the West Indies, right? What he's doing. The fact that just from this ad alone, we know that Hector lived in the West Indies, he lived in Florida, he lived in New York, and then he lived in St. John, New Brunswick. That's like an Atlantic war, African Atlantic world traveler, right? That's what I mean when I say that slavery in the Maritimes is connected to these larger slave societies. And I think that's uh, really important. And of course, Hector's owner unintentionally left historians with a statement about some of the most basic aspects of Hector's life. Now, at the very same time, you know, the advertisement tells us so little, right? There's much absent about Hector. You know, we do not know if he was born in Africa or brought to the West Indies as a young child. Some historians think that when uh, advertisements or other documents say that a black person in the United States or in the American colonies speaks or spoke like a West Indian Negro, uh, they, they think that that indicates that they might have been from Africa, right? And the idea is that there's this sort of pidgin languages, the, the hybrid languages that are going on like Gullah or something like that. Um, the advertisement, and maybe some of you picked up on this, tells historians nothing about his family. Right? Was Hector married? Did he have any children? Why did he run away in a town as unfamiliar as St. John? Perhaps he planned to find his wife or child. Maybe they were free. Maybe they were black loyalists. I don't know. Um, we, know not, we don't know anything about Hector's likes and dislikes. We don't know anything about his hopes and dreams and what he wanted his life to be like if he could obtain freedom. We only have the small set of words that his owner recorded about Hector in an effort to basically, of course, re-enslave him. And that's our, that's our source. Ultimately, the small window historians have into the life of this enslaved person of African descent allows us to consider what his individual life might have meant on the much broader canvas of uh, black enslavement in the Maritimes. And I just wanted to mention that you know of, of all the of all the names that I have, like all 1,300, and I think we're probably it's, we say 1,350, but we just found like 20 or 25 more slaves that we have to add to this dictionary, which is good news, but it's also a lot more work. But um, you know, I would say um, over a third of them, maybe even, maybe even like 40%, getting close to, you know, even, maybe even higher than that, are unnamed, 
there are so many, like literally in my dictionary, it'll say adult male slave of uh, Frederick William Hecht, uh, child slave of John Paul Hamus. Um, you know, because their, their names are not recorded. Literally, we just don't know who they are. We know they existed because they're on a, a some sort of record that says, you know, so and so owns uh, one one adult female slave and two child slaves, and we don't know anything about them. And just to give you an idea of that, you know, it, we should we should never forget that when we see an unnamed slave, that you know they had names. But the fact that the archive can silence something as basic and fundamental to humanity as an individual name underlines the dehumanizing tendencies of slavery in the new world. It's like, don't kid yourself, right? Two examples of unnamed persons of African descent are the short biographical sketches of child slaves who were offered for sale in Nova Scotia during the mid-1780s. I literally know nothing more than what I'm just about to tell you. In 1785, a slave owner offered to sell his, quote, Stout Negro girl, about nine years old. That's all it says. Won't know who the parents were. I don't know her name. And in the ad, it doesn't even say who the owner was. Because a lot of time when they have for sale ads in the Maritimes, it'll just say, uh, you know, such and such black person, for sale, uh, inquirer, inquirer of the printer of the paper. You know, and somebody would go buy the, the newspaper and, and pay for it, you know, and say, OK, how do I pay for it or whatever. And just a few, just uh, one year later, there was an advertisement that said a quote unquote. I'm quoting here, so pardon the language. Um, a likely Negro wench between 10 and 11 years of age. That's it. There's nothing else. Um, and it also speaks to how I think the wider society, or at least white society, wanted to age African American females actually uh, in, in, a, in a very sort of dangerous way. I mean, a 10 or 11 year old, to call them a wench is to call them a, a grown person, and, and they're not. Um, so I think, you know, I, I don't want to end on too negative of a note, but. Uh, these are, the, these are the sources that I'm, I'm dealing with. So I, I'd like to end with two simple questions. Um, you know, uh, these are questions that I do not have the answers for yet because more research is needed. But, but perhaps these queries will encourage other historians to research slavery. Um, first is, is there such a thing as Canadian slavery? And if so, what's Canadian? About Canadian slavery, you know, it's kind of a it's kind of a it's kind of a big question. You know, some people would argue, you know, it was you know that it was Canadian because it wasn't American or Caribbean. It's Canadian because it wasn't based on a staple crop. It's Canadian because it was more intimate, right? And when I say intimate, it means like slave and slave owners are living right next to each other. You know, a slave and in, in the Maritimes, they usually live in the same house as their owner. Um, it was Canadian because of its legal uncertainty. It was Canadian because of the different people enslaved, black and indigenous. Um, these things are all possible. That's what some people, that's one of my friends is making these points to me. But then I would say at the same time, um, I don't know if it's all that much different than northern slavery. I think, it, I think there's a broader thing. I think what there is is there's a, there's a what I would call northeastern North American slavery that goes from about maybe Pennsylvania or if you want to be safe, you could say like New York or New Jersey on up into you know Nova Scotia, Cape Breton, or even Newfoundland. And to me, that's that that slavery is 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 is, is not necessarily Canadian or American. It's just northern, right? Small numbers of slaves, no staple uh, product. Um, domestic service is important for slaves. Uh, intimate owner-slave relations. You know, slaves are living in the same house as their owners, and that's not necessarily a good thing. We used to think like if you were a slave, and the closer you were to your owner, that was actually a good thing. It's like, dear lord, it's like no. I mean, it's bad because then because then you're on call 24/7, right? You, I mean, if you live if you're in South Carolina and there's 200 slaves on a plantation and you live three mi two miles down a road, swampy roads with snakes, you might never have to see your owner. That's like a good thing. You could just you have your own African culture. It, it's not great because the mortality levels are bad, but like you can stay away from your owner. But if you, if you are a slave and, and you live in, you know Halifax or 
uh, you know, Toronto or whatever, and you, you live with your owner, you're around them all the time, you can't escape. They can make you, and of course, uh, female slaves and male slaves in that situation are vulnerable to sexual assault, right? Uh, both. There's a new book out called Rethinking Rufus. It's all about uh, slave owners' um, sexual violence against male slaves. Of course, we've known about the sexual violence against female slaves for a very long time, uh, but now there's a new book I was talking about that, so that, that's just a whole other thing. Um, but so I hope in raising some of these questions, uh, you know, just listening to this, this short paper that y'all have gotten something out of it, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I, I, uh, I just want to say I'm, I'm truly enlightened. Um, I'm an African American, and I've only been in Hamilton for a year. Uh, where are you from? Uh, from New Jersey. Okay, I'm from Maryland. Um, and anyway, I, you know, when you're in the States, you always hear about the Underground Railroad sure. coming up here and, and Canada, freedom, you know. Yeah. And um, so it is um, only recently that I've learned about Canadian slavery. So yeah. um, thank you for enlightening me. Um, I work, actually, I'm a teaching artist, and I work with something called the American Slavery Project in New York. Okay. And this came about as, um, after the discovery of, uh, actually this came much later, but there was a, dis a burial ground. Yeah, discovery. in 1991, yep. Mm -hmm. um, so the American Slavery Project came about during the, 2011 was like the sesquicentennial yep. of the Civil War. Yeah. And so what happened in 2011 was all of the southern states were having like um, celebrations of yeah. Jefferson Davis and all the yeah. Confederate flags were going up. and. And then they were reading the Constitution. There was a reading of the Constitution, and they decided to omit slavery. And um, you know, it was just the, kind of a crazy time. And then in New York City, there were um, three productions, like a Broadway, maybe an um, off-Broadway production of plays about slavery. And none of them were written by African Americans. They were all written by anyone yeah. but African Americans. Mm -hmm. And um, so a playwright friend of mine started the American Slavery Project and just yep. gathered all the writers just to write plays, just to do readings of plays about slavery. Sure. And then she had the idea to go to the African Burial Ground, which has right. become a museum, yep. and got a bunch of writers to write about the burials. Because they, they, they were able, there's like 30,000 bodies down there. Yeah. And they were able to, um, mm -hmm categorize at least 419 of the bodies, so they were able to tell whether that they're male or female, their ages, whether or not they came from the Caribbean or they came straight from Africa. Um, and the only thing you don't know is their names. You don't know who they are. Yeah. So my playwright friend created a, okay. a series of monologues based on just, just creating stories because yeah. you don't know. Um, so that that happened, and I'm so glad you're talking about this because I really didn't know any really yeah. much at all about slavery in in Canada. Hmm. And um, are there such memorials here, like African burial grounds or to slavery? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure somebody here would be better positioned than I, not that I know of. Right. I don't know if there's been something that's there are more the like in the Maritimes is different in some. I mean, like because I know you've only been here for a little while, but like the, it's very different in the Maritimes, like the, the black population and how it relates to things, historical events like the black loyalists were coming in 1783 as opposed to uh, people that went in central Canada, like, you know, in 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s. Um, the, the monuments were like the black cultural centers there. They tend to emphasize uh, the black loyalist, uh, that sort of aspect, free free blacks, black refugees, who were the subject of my first book, um, more than they would something like slavery. And you know, and I and I get it, you know, because I, you know, I'm even though I'm an American, I grew up in the South. You know, I, I lived in Nova Scotia for seven years, so I became intimately familiar with some of the different things that were going on. And you know, it, you know, especially in the Maritimes. There's such a small black middle class. There's not really like a black bourgeoisie at all. You know, there's no Howard University. There's nothing. Do you know what I mean? Right. And so when I started to study slavery, you know, I had a, 
older black woman who recently, unfortunately, it, it, dot passed away. Um, she just said to me, she said, you know, Amani, she said, um, thank you for your, the work you're doing. She's like, but, you know, it's important for us to have something to feel proud of. And she's like, you, you understand that for us, so black loyalists are something to be very proud of. But if you're telling us that we might actually, in fact, descend from people who are actually enslaved in the Maritimes, which is possible, you know, she's like, can you understand how that's that's hurtful to 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 me and to our and to our group, you know? And it was like, yeah, like I mean, yeah, I know. And so, so, so. I think that slavery is not only an uncomfortable, when I say it's an uncomfortable topic in Canada, I mean that beyond race. It's uncomfortable for not only quote unquote white Canadians, but also for people who we would describe as African Canadians as well, right? Um, so, you know, coming from a place, you know, coming from New Jersey or from Maryland or from the United States, coming to Canada and sort of dealing with the similarities of racism, but also the differences, right? I mean, for me, and I can't speak to your experience, you know, Canada was very different for me. Like, I grew up in a place where, I mean, you know, if you knew, you knew people didn't like you because you were black, they just told you, right? It was, it, 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 it was different, uh, Maryland, Virginia area. I'm from Baltimore. So yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, and more, more, some, yeah, I could go on. Okay, go ahead and we'll just come around maybe. As an immigrant, white woman from Europe um, in 57. I've, I'm a proud Canadian citizen, and your enthusiasm is palpable. But as a Canadian, I am astonished to learn that we didn't know about our indigenous problems, our Japanese internment, our black slavery, and on and on it goes. And I don't know how we in Canada have been able to keep this all silent. And I find it overwhelming um, to learn all about it. And thank you for this. Well, thank you. I, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't, it, that's, I, I, I hear you. I mean, you know, I, the only thing I can think of, I mean, and like I said, I don't live in Canada, so I mean, seriously, I mean, look where I live now, right? We have our own problems, but, but um, <laughs> I love America patriotic, right, in that camera. And so, <laughs> so, so I, I mean, I, I, I think, I don't know if it's because when you sometimes you compare Canada to United States, it, at least in American eyes, and I think also in some Canadian eyes, it just doesn't seem as bad, right? Like, um, for I mean, the the because we don't know about it because we don't know about it, or maybe the actual like you know, yes, there is slavery in Canada, but you do not have like the mass industrial slavery right. of Mississippi, right? There are racial problems and racism and racial violence in Canada, right? But in the United States, like we've got like the Jesse Washington lynching, we got the Sam Hose lynching, we ha right? And we have all of these sort of events. It doesn't mean there's not racism or not bad negative things happening in Canada, but so I think sometimes people have wanted to compare the two. Well, it's not as bad as it is, you know, down there. And I think that comparison, that, that sort of thing that people do when comparing the United States to Canada, um, yeah, it's, 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 you know, I, I think sometimes it does a disservice to Canada because I think it's important, you know, no matter what our history says, to tell the truth and that that's okay. Like, I'd rather know than not know. Go ahead. Um, I'm also an American. I just came here to get my master's. Um, Where are you from? I'm from Connecticut. Okay. Yeah, and um, I just read a piece for one of my classes from Ofua Cooper about mm -hmm. black resistance in northern Canada from like black slaves. And I was wondering in your research if you found any resistance uh, in the Maritimes? Yeah, now, w which Ofua is an old dear friend of mine. Oh. But, but what article are you talking about? Um, just so I know. It's like, specifically about black resistance and like. Sure. Um, what journal was it from? I don't remember. Okay, yeah. so 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 I think if you don't, yeah, I mean you find lots of black resistance. I mean every day is resistance in a way, right? They're always resisting. I mean runaways, that's resistance. Um, but if you mean like resistance, like Nat Turner resistance, like if, if like sort of like like a, like a violent resistance. I mean a good example of resistance for me is Diana Bastian, who I wrote about and Afua has also written about. Diana Bastian was a young 
black girl who was brought to Cape Breton from Albany, New York by a guy by the name of Abraham Kyler. Abraham Kyler was the former governor of Albany, or excuse me, mayor of Albany, New York. And he bought this, this young girl up there. And when she was about 15 years old, she is raped by this man, George Moore, who was a member of the governor's council, very powerful guy. And basically, before she gives birth to these two, she, was, she had twins. Uh, before she gives birth, she basically tried to go to a, a judge who was actually Moore's brother to say, look, what's happening to me is wrong. This isn't right. And they sort of like just refused to help her. But she was like actually trying to fight back. And the only reason why we know about this act of resistance is because at St. George's Anglican Church, the, when, when Diana Bastian at age 15 gave birth to these two twins, only one lived, she died. So she died at like age 15. And... The, the only reason we know about this is because a church recorder sort of wrote it down. He said, on this day, July, you know, 1794, whatever, and he tells the story of this woman's sort of heroic resistance to what this man, George Moore, had done to her. And I guess I would ask you, um, you know, as master students, I, I would say to you, maybe, like, even be more specific with your question of resistance. Like, how do we define resistance? Resistance means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And some historians, not all, but some historians are very skeptical of the concept of resistance. I'm personally not. But there are forms of resistance that are everyday resistance. An everyday form of resistance would be like not working. Or one of the most famous or funny ones is urinating in master's coffee, right? That's, that's a form of everyday resistance. Then there's resistance like, mm, when you go to bed tonight, I'm going to stab you, right? <laughs> right? And, 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 and these, these things happen. So, I mean, there's a lot of different types of forms of resistance that go on in the Maritimes, like in a, in a daily sort of way. But I'd say the most basic, fundamental way is running away. That's the... That's, that's the that's you know, and sometimes, it, you know, you see slavery as like a form of negotiation. This is a long argument that historians have had. And what I mean by that is, for example, there's a slave. His name was, I think, I believe his name was James. He runs away because he's, he's pissed off at his owner, this guy named Abel Menchner. Okay. And so this guy, he writes this runaway slave ad and he says, well, he ran away, here's what he looks like, and then at the very bottom it says, in P.S., he said, if James will just come home, I'll forgive him. <laughs> he will be forgiven. There's no problems here. And it speaks to this sort of thing that's constantly going on between slaves and owners, right? There's this, they're, you know, they're, they're constantly, slaves are constantly trying to get a little bit more, whether that's, you know, getting their owner to buy a marriage partner so they can live with somebody, whether, you know, it's uh, we want to have more Saturday night dances, whether it's we'd like to have more rum. They are always like they're always fighting to get make their lives a little bit better in whatever way that looks like. Right. So I think resistance happens in many different ways from every day to violent. Right. To Nat Turner. So thank you. Yeah, I. I recognize that there are different, you know, resistance, which is amazing. I just didn't know with like the limited resources mm -hmm. available, like what was out there. You know? I would say the other form. Okay, the other thing I would look at is court records, because usually when when a black per person wants to run away or claim their freedom, there's like a story behind it. And if you're ever going to get like a good long story where you find out quite a bit about somebody, it's going to be in a court record. And I think that's the place is another place where I've seen the most resistance or also in runaway documents. And sometimes you'll see it in wills and estate papers, depending on what a person writes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there were some hands up here. Uh, go ahead and I'll come back. I am. Um, Thank you. The authorities. Sure. Was it, like obviously it wasn't legal to, to actually own were they not cracking down on uh... it, It's legal to own slaves. That's not a problem. Is it? Okay, now you've gotten into a very complicated area. Okay, so I'll try to explain it as, ba as, as, like, as quickly as I can because it's actually like a whole paper length. <laughs> like I've written book chapters about this. So slavery in the Maritimes does not have statute 
law. There's nothing like a slave code in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, although there's hundreds if not thousands of people who are clearly enslaved. The only part of the Maritimes that has a law that legalizes slavery is Prince Edward Island from 1781. It's an act to, to to baptize um, uh, slaves. And basically it says, if you baptize a slave, that doesn't mean they're free, which w r really comes from 17th century Virginia. Um, but basically slavery is given tacit acknowledgement as a form of private property. It's a highly unusual form of private property, but basically everyone knows that slavery exists, but it doesn't get statute legal protection. And slave owners constantly try to get slavery recognized in the law in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. They try to do it in 1787, 1789, 1801, and 1808, right? And also in 1801 in New Brunswick. They're constantly trying to get some sort of law passed, even if it's for gradual emancipation. That's the most hilarious part about it. But they want that statute law because they know that slavery is tenuous. Now, at the very same time, you have judges in Nova Scotia who, they're at least after mid 1790s, they're anti-slavery, but they, they basically don't want to have a big court decision like, say, the Somerset case, right, where there's like a decision against like slavery writ large. They sort of want to chip away at it very slowly. I think S.S. Blower, Blowers and Thomas Strange were the chief justices in Nova Scotia. They both are anti-slavery, but one of them says, the reason why they avoided a direct decision on the issue of slavery, like to try to just make it like completely illegal, was they didn't want to quote unquote throw so much property up in the air all at once. And so what, what's going on there is that judges like SS blowers, they basically will try to bait slave owners into coming to court to get slavery protected. They actually try to do this multiple times. So, Basically, for example, a slave will run away, okay, and will run to a house of a friendly white person. Slave owner will say, that's my slave, I own that slave. So then SS Blowers is like, well, why don't you come to court and try the right? Right, he bait, he, come on, and so they go to court, and they're there, and Blowers always finds sort of against slavery. He'll say, uh, can you prove that you rightfully own this person as a slave? Now, a lot of these loyalists, you know, they're ridden out of town on a rail. They don't, they don't have sometimes like a, a bill of sale. So then he says, well, you don't have a bill of sale. This person's free. Sorry. Right. Other times, if they do produce a bill of sale, he'll say something like, um, can you prove that the person who you bought this slave from owned the slave legally? No, you can't. So he directs the jury, well, we're going we're gonna to find against this slave owner. They cannot recover their property. He does this continually. And what happens in Nova Scotia is that slave owners realize that they don't have like statute protection, right? So what they, what they decide by the early 1800s is it's best just to replace slavery with indentured servitude or with just free servitude and just let these people go. And you read it in the wills all the time. It'll say, uh, my former slave, now a servant, you know, Betty, please leave her 20 pounds every year for the rest of her natural life. Like it's clear that slavery just sort of peters out and dies in Nova Scotia. In New Brunswick, the judges actually find in favor of slavery in several cases. And as a result, slavery lasts longer there. But neither, probably until you were asking, and probably until like the 18, maybe late 1810s, maybe even early 1820s, but certainly the late 1810s. Um, so so it, slavery's legal status is very tenuous, it's very complicated, and you know, the best people, I've, I've written about it in North to Bondage, but the, the real experts on it are, are D.G. Bell, who wrote a paper in the University of New Brunswick uh, Law Journal in 1982. He's a colleague of mine, I've written a, a couple articles with him, and Barry Cahill, who's a dear old friend of mine, he's an archivist, um, and he also wrote articles about the loyalist and, uh, and, and slavery. It's very complicated because how do you live in a society where slaves are in the newspapers, 
uh, slaves are in probate records, they're in court records, right? But you're denying, in terms of statute law, that slavery actually exists. That's what they do. It's a very strange situation. It took me many years to even be able to understand it. So in trying to explain it to you in five, years, uh, five minutes, I apologize if it didn't make sense. Now, um, and then I'll come to you back then. Times, uh, was the, the situation uh, similar to Upper Canada or no? I mean, in some ways, this is a debate. I mean, it, it's, 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 it, it's, it's, it's the numbers are different, from what I understand. Um, there's there is a legal there. There's a process where slavery sort of ends in Upper Canada. It's a little different than we have it down in the Maritimes, but it's uh, it's 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 it's. it's it, what we really need, we have different articles and book chapters. What we need is like a big book on Canadian slave law. I think that would actually be the, the most beneficial for us. Go ahead. Um, first of all, thank you so much for such a, a fascinating talk. Um, as someone whose research centers on enslaved women and children in an ancient Roman context. Sure. Um, <laughs> no. Talk is so fascinating. Um, I love uh, Roman history. Uh, Sorry, I know I can't. I can. I can barely read a, a, a little bit of Latin. But go ahead. That's okay. Um, and so, just uh, your, the comments that you made about sort of the the, the, the complex relationship between um, female slave owners and female slaves. I think that that's a question that I think spans um, at all populations that have some form of uh, slavery associated with it. Um, but I, I have a, a demography question. Um, so Shoot, I might not have an answer, but go that's ahead. Okay, um, I'm just curious. So I, I realized that in the Maritimes, that so in addition to being um, quite quite fluid in in nature, um, and also uh, to, just sort of the, the population um, uh, is in constant uh, flux. Sure. Um, is it possible to sort of comment on sort of the um, mm -hmm. uh, sort of gender demographics? Like, do do we know and and like. Sure. Um, I know you have those uh, the the one thousand three hundred and fifty plus uh, yeah. names, but um, do, so do we have uh, sort of the numbers that you know male slaves, male loyalist slaves versus female loyalist slaves? Yeah, versus, sure. And, and also with respect to age, so like how many children yeah. are are uh, present uh, in this area at, at this time? Or so. Yeah, so I mean, okay, this is like a very problematic question. And the reason why is because most of the, the, the doc, and I talk about this like in detail in North to Bondage, is that, you know, we don't always really know who's actually a slave, right? Because a lot of times they refer to these people as servants, and it's really actually not clear if those servants were actually chattel slaves. Sometimes it's not clear if they were even maybe white free servants or black free servants or indentured. It's not always super clear. Those, 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 those sort of documents are a little bit unclear. But when I looked at the Book of Negroes, right? But again, I think in the Book of Negroes, out of the several thousand black, maybe 3,000 black people listed or so, um, I, w I was able to sort of find around 333 of them who were um, in still enslaved and going to the Maritimes. And I sort of put this in an appendix in the book. I'm trying to, so I don't want to misquote myself, but I believe, let's see. Um, and I list them all, all their names and their alleged ages. Um, you know, it says there were uh, 333 black slaves relocated to the Maritimes. Of them, 177 were uh, male and 149 were female. And there were 82 enslaved children who were aged 12 or younger. Now, but that's based on just the Book of Negroes. And I can't tell you out of the you know, 1,500 people that might have, to 2,000 people that might have been slaves, that that 332 is actually repre it's at best representative. We don't really know. Uh, the other document that I have in here, and if you'll just indulge me, is in 1807, there was a, um, there was a petition from slave owners in Digby as late as 1807. Now, can I remind you, they, they, they represent, they had like 85 slaves. Um, and maybe 25 or 27 owners. So the interesting thing here is you realize 1807 people are doing this. I mean, like every single northern state had adopted emancipation or gradual emancipation by then. 
than these people, right? They're petitioning in 1807. They're like, um, we're, we're not. I mean, it's hilarious that the, 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 the petition is great. It says in it, it says, uh, we don't pretend to advocate slavery as a system. However, um, we would like to be able to get some compensation. But the reason I brought this up was, um, let's see. So according to this, that um, uh, to this one, and this is sort of not, it's depressing, but uh, about 42% of the, sl of, the, of the slaves that were listed uh, in this petition, because they listed them uh, not by name, they just listed them as male slaves, female slaves, and then child slaves. Didn't say any of their names. So in my biographical dictionary, it's like male slave of John Taylor, male adult slave, ma a female slave, John Taylor, child slave. I mean, it's pretty, you know, we don't really know that much. But basically what it says is 42% um, of the slaves were children, 35 out of 84, and women made up about 45% of adult slaves, which isn't all that different, right, from the Book of Negroes. I mean, it's not like super different because it seems that maybe 50, you know, it seems that maybe, you know, 55% were uh, um, men, 45% female. I mean, you know, but doing this, it's, you know, it's, it's limited. Like it can tell you something, but I don't know that it tells you a whole lot. I mean, most of us historians were pretty convinced, at least in 1783, when the loyalists first get there, 1783, 84, there's probably like 1,500, they probably bring 1,500 black slaves with them. But so many of them get to Shelburne and they look at it and they're like, okay, we got to go back to the United States, right? It's like, I, I mean, there's like so much, so much wrong with it. They just can't, it's like, I'm out, right? They're done, they're gone. So, we, you know, it's kind of hard to tell how many of them returned immediately. Some of them moved out to Fredericton, St. John, which had much better land. Some of them moved out to Digby. You know, and, and the sources aren't always clear. And I mean, I, I'm fully willing to admit to you that I'm not a great demographic historian. Um, but, but, you know, it, it'd be nice if, if there was a, you know, if there was a breakdown of slaves. And the funny thing is, in 1801, when these slave owners in Nova Scotia petition the, the, sta the, 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 the Nova Scotia Assembly, they basically say, well, we want to get, if you're going to free our slaves, if you're going to take our slaves away from us, we would like the, 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 you know, the, the province, basically, to make a listing of all slaves with their names and with, the, with their value. The reason they want this is because they want to get compensation for their slaves, right? Basically, what the British ended up doing in 1834 is what they actually want in 1801. The funny thing about that is, like, if they had actually won and gotten support for that, we would have had a great document of slave names, slave ages, and slave values. And that would be great. You know, and now that you're talking about demographic stuff, also in terms of prices, it's very hard to tell the values of slaves because a lot of times in the records, you know, it'll say, you know, this slave is worth 35 pounds, right? But doesn't tell you is that sometimes that's New York money, sometimes it's sterling, some it's ne it's very very confusing. So you have to. I guess if you're going to do slavery in the Maritimes and maybe slavery in other places, you have to be willing to deal with some form of ambiguity, you know? But that might say more about my like inability as a historian than anything else. I don't, I don't know. So. No, I can take a couple more questions. Just one quick question. <laughs> no, I, go ahead. And you I got... see you haven't lost the enthusiasm for, for this topic after so many years. I know. That's cool. You were, you were <laughs> as passionate as you are now. Uh, the, the question I have has to do with the relevance of all this. And it's a question we all come across as historians. The so what question. Sure. Why is this story important? Yeah. And I know you were recently um, recruited or, you know, uh, contacted by Dalhousie University to sit on a presidential committee to examine the role of Dalhousie University and the founders of Dalhousie mm. University in slavery. Yeah. And that is a big report that made national headlines. I was glad to see you contributed to that report. And based on that document, I know Dalhousie University, our alma mater, mm. is now rethinking a lot of its policy, its naming, renaming new buildings and all that. So could you speak to how this deep and important historical work you're doing mm. is actually shaping today's world, the deep yeah. experiences of descendants mm. of enslaved Africans, and how we order our society? 
Yeah, well, I think in, you're seeing that with Dalhousie and also with Kings, right? It's like the Maritimes coming to grips with some of the problems that it has. And make no mistake about it, I can't speak for other parts of Canada, but Nova Scotia has got some serious racial issues. And I was mentioning this earlier with you. I mean, you know, I, I grew up in a place like Maryland, Virginia, D.C. area, where, you know, my parents were professors at Howard University. That's not, that doesn't exist for black people in Nova Scotia at all. And if you talk to black people in Nova Scotia, Dalhousie might as well be located on Jupiter as far as they're concerned, right? No, no very few black people go to, have ever felt welcome at Dalhousie, ever. Right, uh, most black people either go to Mount St. Vincent or they go to St. Mary's. Um, so, I'd like to think that my work has forcing, at least encouraging Dalhousie to rethink some of its policies and maybe at a higher level to really think about recruiting more, you know, faculty of color. You know, Dalhousie hasn't been too great about that. And I think if it's a broader thing in Canada, maybe Canadians will start to have more of a conversation about what race means in Canada. You know, and that's okay, and people don't have to be scared of it. You know, I, mean, I think one of the benefits of living in the United States is like, well, it's all out there. You know, even pre, pre, pre-2016, right? I mean, people, people know race is an issue. And so I think that if my work encourages people in Canada to have a conversation about race, that would make me happy. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Last one? Okay. Um, I, um, I just want to say like, thank you very much for coming in and sharing knowledge because like, especially I really appreciate like, your work and actually trying to like, get the conversation going in Canada because like, yeah. I like, actually like, grew up like, around here throughout my whole life, so I've gone through like, the school system. Canada and everything, and yeah. I know firsthand that, like, as a black person, like, we don't see our history, like, actually represented at all, yeah. and fortunately, like, I have parents that actually told me to learn my history and, like, made me watch Roots and stuff, so I yeah. actually have. <laughs> I mean, so you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. yeah it's a great. Um, but yeah, like, honestly, just even living here now, like, you don't hear a lot about it. You honestly yeah. just, like, Canada's yeah. very focused on looking at themselves in negative terms, in terms of saying like, oh, we're Canada because we're not the United States. Yeah. So, oh, we can't have done all these bad things. And yeah. a lot of the time, like it goes around this concept of, oh, Canada is one of the best places in the world to live. Sure. It's so great yeah. that we often forget about the bad things yeah. that have happened or don't address them. Like it's the same thing with indigenous peoples, like residential schools was a huge sure. thing. Totally damaging, but we don't actually learn yeah. about it in elementary schools. And yeah, I really appreciate that you're coming in to talk about it because I didn't really know a lot about black history in Canada that much and I want to learn more but it's yeah it's definitely a conversation that's kind of swept under the rug so that we can continue thinking that we're I mean and I Thank you, and I, I think it's it's such. I love coming to Canadian schools. It's such an honor and so much fun as an American. And for me, it's always a strange thing. I mean, you know, when I, because where I grew up and how I grew up, you know, I, I like when I first. I mean, I, all I heard about Canada growing up in the states was like, oh, people there, uh, uh, white people there aren't racist. That's what <laughs> that's what people said. That, but but you know, I'm growing up in the South, and I mean, like you you can understand why black people, African Americans felt that way. And to be honest with you, my grandfather used to, okay, I mean like, I'm 45, my dad, unfortunately, let's see, he's 79, he's getting a little bit frail, a little bit older. Um, his father, who, my grandfather's a World War II veteran, um, you know, they used to take their, my grandfather used to take my father and his sister, when they went on vacation from uh, Chicago, they will go on vacation in the Maritimes because they could find hotels there. Like that stuff on Green Book isn't a lie. That's true. There are a lot of black families. And the reason why I know this is true is because my mother and father are divorced, but my stepfather, who's an African-American guy from North Carolina, you know, his parents took him up to the Maritimes in the 1950s. Like that, so, so it's weird, right? It's complicated. Like, I, I don't know a lot of black people who grew up in the South who wouldn't come to these parts of Canada and be like, wow, this is like kind of good. Because compared to what you're used to, it, it is actually a little bit different. Now that doesn't make it good. And that, because what I found living in Canada was that, that the sort of racism that goes on in Canada is much more insidious. Right. Mm. It's much more subtle. Mm. 
It's, and it's very internal in a way. I mean, when I lived in the Maritimes, Ian and I were talking about this earlier, um, you know, my, my girlfriend at the time in, in, in graduate school, uh, you know, we're still friends. I mean, you know, people's families, like white families in Nova Scotia, treated me better, and, may, and I don't know about Bonnie, but treated me better be, precisely because I wasn't a black Nova Scotian. Like, as far as they were concerned, I, I was different, right? Like, it was okay to talk about, the, you know, those people. But we don't, we don't mean you, you know, your, your, parents, your parents are at Howard. I mean, I'm serious, it was really weird. I was like, this is weird. I was like, I don't, so, so I think that, that race works in very complicated ways in Canada. It's like, you know, people get upset with the Underground Railroad stuff, but that stuff is kind of true. Right, there are people that came here and their lives were better. There were, you know, my friend uh, Carolyn Frost does a lot of stuff on this. Like, you know, if, if you're coming from Kentucky in 1850s and you end up in, and you end up in, you know, somewhere in Canada West, yeah, it's not great, but it's a little bit better, right? And and I think, so I think that's true. But I also realize as somebody who had that transnational black experience of, you know. And I didn't just live in Canada for like three weeks while I was doing research here. Like I lived here for seven years. And I, and I lived on Gottingen Street. I lived near Uniac Square in Halifax for a couple of years. I mean, it, race and the way it works in Canada is, like you said, it's, it, it, in some ways it's swept under, some ways it's better. But then you look at minority representation among faculty at Canadian schools, and it's like, I look at America, like we're doing way better than that, right? So how, what? How do you, how do you, I, I have friends who were at African American, African Canadian friends now, African American, who were at Canadian schools and left and went to American schools because they thought it was better there. So, what does that say? I, you know, I don't know. I've only had a job at, a, at an American school. It's Vermont, so it's like we're kind of Canadian, but, but, um, <laughs> so I, I think everything you're saying, you know, I can hear. And Bonnie, I, I don't want to, but you know, he, he tells me that he, he was joking with Myrtle that I looked. Quite like you when I was your age. I know how that sounds because I used to have dreadlocks like down here. There's a time before I went bald. So thank you all so much.